What if a game used screenshots as shareable postcard save files, so you could send a photo to a friend and they could hop in right at that moment? In this video, we'll try four techniques from steganography to training our own neural network, but first, why? I was adding UI to support multiple save slots in Feral North, and I decided I wanted a screenshot just to show where the game had saved. It's easier to recognize a picture than a Gallic Island name. But now we have two files to manage, and whenever you're dealing with file IO, you have to account for when things go wrong because they inevitably will. You might write the save file successfully, but then the screenshot fails because the user's disk is full or on fire or something. You can embed the screenshot as a blob within the save data, but that introduces its own problems. And then I had one of those thoughts that triggers a long, distracting technical adventure. What if the screenshot was the save file? And what if each in-game picture you took encoded the save data so you could hop back in right at that moment? There's a whole lot of data to keep track of in a save file though, so for a first crack at this, there's actually a really simple way to hide text in an image file, which is EXIF tags text metadata stored within image files that contain things like geolocation, camera make and model, editing software, stuff like that. It's quite easy to write some arbitrary data to the EXIF tags and simply read it back from the image on startup. And this does work. But EXIF tags have two big flaws. First, a lot of platforms strip EXIF data for privacy to reduce file size. Plus, you need the actual file, since the data isn't in the picture itself, only in the file metadata. Ideally, we'd find a way to hide data inside the picture itself. This is called steganography. It's the art of hiding data in plain sight. Have a look at these two images. Can you spot the difference? Spoiler alert, you can't, but an algorithm can tell us that this one has a hidden message. As opposed to something like encryption where it's obvious that data is being masked, steganography presents something seemingly normal, like a screenshot from a game, when in reality it holds a secret message. Back in my shader game video where I made a game entirely inside of a fragment shader, I hid data in the alpha channel of the screen texture, which you could argue is a form of steganography. Maybe we could do something similar here. The only trouble is, in the shader game, I had full control over the rendering of the final image and knew the alpha channel could be ignored. Here, the whole point is to be able to share the save file like any other image. People are definitely going to notice that their image is all splotchy with each pixel having effectively random transparency, so we can't get away with that. It's too obvious that there's something off about the image, whereas steganography promises us that we would have a seemingly normal file. So messing with the alpha channel is no good, but what if we mess with the red, green, blue, and alpha channels? Surely that would be much worse, right? Consider four numbers, each from 0 to 255, which together form the color of a single pixel with transparency. So for instance, with 0, 255, 0, 255, we have a green opaque pixel. If we change this to say 1, 254, 1, 254, we still basically have an opaque green pixel. You can't actually tell anything has changed with a difference that small, especially when this pixel is 1 in a million. But it has changed, and if we can change the data, then we can detect those changes and assign meaning to them. And it turns out there's an algorithm called least significant bit for just this purpose. Consider the binary representation of this pixel. Now, don't be scared if you don't know binary, it's really quite simple. I can teach you in just a few seconds, I promise. Here's a number in binary. To convert it to a more familiar number, simply add the ones. You should get four. Easy, right? The only catch is each digit is worth double the last, starting from the right. Sum the ones again, but this time use their value instead of one. You should get 64 plus 16 plus eight plus two for a total of 90. And there you go, you can now read binary. So given a binary number, what's the smallest possible change we can make to it? Well, since the rightmost bit is only worth one, it's the least significant bit. So flipping it is always going to be the smallest change we can make. In this case, flipping the bit takes us from 90 to 91. And if we had 91, the smallest change we can make is still simply flipping the least significant bit, taking us back to 90. The last bit is always least significant. So let's take this back to our image. All that the least significant bit algorithm does is hide our data in that last bit. Each pixel gives us four channels, meaning four numbers, meaning four least significant bits. If we make the least significant change to each pixel, flipping its last bit, then we end up with our still basically opaque green pixel, and no one's the wiser. Now to hide our save data in these pixels, we need to represent each character as a binary number. Thankfully, the ASCII table assigns each character to a number from 0 to 255. The maximum of 255 is not an accident. Its binary equivalent is 11111111. So 255 is the highest number we can represent in 8-bit binary. And that means as long as we stick to these letters and symbols described by ASCII, we can represent any of them as an 8-bit binary number. Okay, let's encode a letter. Say a capital K, which is 75 in ASCII, and the following in binary. We take the next two pixels of the image and assign their least significant bits to match the binary value of our character. Repeat this for every character in our save file, and voila! The pixels are barely changed, completely imperceptible to the human eye, but the data is there, so we can decode it by simply reading the last bit of each channel of each pixel to reconstruct our save file. 
It's a simple but quite powerful technique for encoding data in images, and I don't know about you, but I feel like Aspire is something encoding these secret messages, so that's a bit of a bonus. But unfortunately, it does have drawbacks. First, it's quite expensive to read and write 8 million pixels. You can decrease the image size, of course, but the smaller the image, the less data you can store. More concerning is if the image is resized or compressed whatsoever, then our data is lost. There's no fault tolerance here since it relies on the smallest possible change to each pixel. By definition, that means it's immediately ruined by any modification to the image. Unfortunately, this one's out. We really need something with a bit more fault tolerance. And it turns out there's a super common technique for encoding data in images that everyone, even your parents, are very familiar with, and that's QR codes. QR codes actually come with a built-in error correction technique called Reed Solomon, the same technique that keeps CDs, DVDs, and Blu-rays tolerant to damage without losing data. And this is why you can scan a QR code that's partially stained or even missing. It's easy enough to generate a little QR code and slap it on the screenshot, but we immediately have a new problem. With least significant bit, we had a total of 4 megabytes of storage space, but the max a QR code can store is only about 3 kilobytes, less than 1 1,000th. A Feral North save is 37 kilobytes, or 12 times what could fit inside of a QR code, so we need to optimize that. I use a popular Unity library called EasySave3 for save files, but ES3 bloats the size by including type information that I really don't need. Replacing ES3 with a very simple JSON encoder takes us to about 12 kilobytes, which is much better, but still 4 times too large for a QR code. JSON is structured and repetitive, which means it's a great candidate for compression. So by gzipping the data before writing it to the disk, we go from 12 kilobytes to only 2 kilobytes. Now the data fits, but god, it's really ugly. It completely ruins the image for me, like a marketing poster rather than a carefully captured photo. Because of the Reed Solomon error correction, we can resize and compress the image without losing data, but ideally we'd have fault tolerance without impacting the visuals. And you might be thinking, hey Kyle, I think you've gone too far on this silly experiment, just release Feral North already. And you're right, but I have one more idea, and if I want to sleep peacefully tonight, I need to explore it. What if we trained our own neural network to run image recognition on the screenshot to determine its location? For a game with checkpoint-based saves like Farewell North, it's really a simple classification problem. Given a reference screenshot, I can reliably tell you which is the nearest checkpoint in Farewell North, so it stands to reason that given sufficient references, a neural network should be able to do the same. I used to do some ML work, and years ago I trained a convolutional neural network on video footage of my powerlifting competitions to predict whether a live camera feed showed a squat, bench, or deadlift. I dusted off that old code and took 30 second videos of three checkpoints in Farewell North, just sort of gently moving the camera around to get some variation. Next I made a little docker image that uses FFmpeg to split the video frames into thousands of screenshots, which we can use to train our model. Which brings us to Machine Learning 101, a much deeper subject than binary, but here's my attempt at a quick primer. The core idea is to learn by taking a ton of sample data, in this case video frames, and splitting it into three datasets. The first is the training data, which represents the majority of the images, and what the algorithm, in this case a convolutional neural network, is going to try to model. The next is validation data, which is reserved to tell our algorithm how well it's doing. The algorithm fits to the training set, tuning its weights in an attempt to predict something from a given data point, and then we evaluate it by running predictions on the separate validation data. So in this case, learn from these thousands of checkpoint images, and then predict which checkpoints are in these images. We score how well it did, and then repeat this process tens or hundreds or even thousands of times, each time hopefully getting a little bit better at predicting the validation data as the model learns. And that's really the main idea, but I did say there are three datasets. The key is to set some data aside that's never used in the training or validation datasets. We call this the test data. And when our model is done training, we score it against this test data it's never seen before. This is important to prevent the model from overfitting, meaning it's optimizing for the training and validation data instead of the general problem the model is being trained for. It's like a kid telling you that 3 times 3 is 9, not because they understand multiplication, but because they memorize the multiplication table. Now there's of course much more to machine learning, but that's the basic idea. To accomplish this, I'm running a bit of Python using TensorFlow, which is an open source ML library developed by Google. Even with a few thousand frames, it's not a ton of data, so to augment the dataset and add more defense against overfitting, I introduce random variations to the images, flipping them, rotating them, zooming in, basically just adding more variety to help generalize to new images. From there, it runs a very basic convolutional neural network, which is a special type of neural network that's particularly well suited to finding patterns in images. And we can see it does remarkably well on the validation data after only a couple rounds of training, achieving 100% accuracy, which is usually a sign the model is overfitting to the validation data. And that's why we kept that test data on the side. It's like asking the kid to multiply numbers that weren't on the multiplication table. On the test data, it actually surprisingly achieves 100% accuracy as well, which is promising, but even though it's never seen those frames, they did come from the same video files, so they are very similar to ones it's seen before. 
To be absolutely sure, let's take a brand new screenshot and try to throw it off with some post-processing tweaks to really make it unique. Even though the screenshot looks entirely different, it does still manage to predict that it's the canoe checkpoint. Now, full disclosure, data science and machine learning is not my area of discipline. I have done some ML work professionally, but I am not an expert. So while I'm satisfied that this proves it's doable, I would want to collaborate with someone who's a bit more of an expert in this field to make sure it's rock solid. And of course, unfortunately, this alone won't be enough. The screenshot tells us nothing of which collectibles these are found, the optional or out of sequence levels that they completed. Basically, a picture isn't always worth a thousand words, so as neat as this is, it's not a full solution without additional metadata. So in the end, this was all a really fun experiment and I got image previews, optimized save files, and learned a few things out of it. But I'm not going to use images as save files in Feral North. Each approach is far too error prone and compute intensive, and frankly it just makes sense to use text files for this. I do think a postcard system like this could be quite interesting for the right kind of game, but I'll leave that discovery for someone else. So thank you for joining me down this rabbit hole, and hopefully you learned a thing or two as well. I'd like to thank all my patrons who help support me as I develop Feral North and make these videos especially those on the Magpie tier, and my Osprey supporters Elegon, Geek Brony, Spooky Josh, and Purple Sloth Studio. The neural network source code is linked down below if you want to check it out, but otherwise thank you for watching, and I will see you in the next one.